I'm Zeke on GitHub and Zeke on Twitter. Um, I work at GitHub and I work on the Electron team. And this is my son. My wife sent me this picture about an hour ago, so I just wanted to share it with you. <laughs> so before we jump in and talk about user land, I want to talk a little bit about the history of JavaScript. So <laughs> I forgot this part. <laughs> OK. So Netscape was the first environment that JavaScript ran in. This came out in 1994. Um, so browsers were the first place that JavaScript existed, and that was the case for a long time. Uh, Internet Explorer came along in 1995, and Microsoft used its power to eventually crush Netscape. Uh, fortunately, before Netscape uh, was acquired by AOL, they open sourced all of the Netscape software and created the Mozilla Foundation. Eventually, in 2000, um, the Firefox browser was created, and it was essentially a revitalization of the Netscape browser. Later, Google got into the browser game and created Chrome and its open source uh, core, Chromium. And at this time in the world of development, if you were a JavaScript developer, you could really only create web pages. Um, so if you wanted to do other kinds of development, like making servers or just running code in any other environment, you had to learn these other languages like Java or PHP or Ruby. Um, so this was kind of a, an embarrassing time to be a JavaScript developer, um, but that was all about to change. Uh, Node came along, and uh, props to Substack for creating this awesome graphic that really encapsulates uh, what V8 and Node did for JavaScript. So along with Node um, came the NPM package manager. And this is, when I say user land, this is really what I mean by, by user land. Node is like a, um, it's a simple runtime with a basic set of APIs for accessing the file system and making network re requests and things like, things like that. And then NPM is this giant package registry. And the beauty of NPM is that they've made it very simple for people to create code packages and publish them and share them with the world. So we've seen this explosion of um, creativity in the JavaScript uh, user land space because of NPM. So here's just a sampling of some of the modules that exist in, in NPM user land. So as you all know, there are tons of packages in the JavaScript registry. This is a hyperbolic exaggeration of how quickly the packages are created. Um, but there are 400 new packages created every single day, so there's, there's a lot going on. So the trouble is, with all the, it's great that we have all these packages, but how do we know which ones are good and which ones are appropriate for, for our particular use cases? So uh, I worked at NPM for a while, and uh, I designed and created the first refresh of the NPM website, which looked like this in 2004. Um, nowadays, it looks like this. So in the last, or I said 2004, I meant 2014. So in the last two years, uh, we've seen very little um, improvement in the NPM website, unfortunately. They changed the color of the header to blue, and they added ads. But aside from that, we haven't really seen any real innovation with the NPM website, which is kind of unfortunate because it's a really important piece of our everyday lives as JavaScript developers. So um, Recently, the NPM website was also closed source. Um, so for a while, it was an open source repository, which was challenging to run, but at least there was some transparency about how the website worked and what the features were. Um, and then recently, it just went dark, so we don't the public doesn't have much insight into uh, what NPM Incorporated is actually working on and what their motivations are. Also, there's no public API for interacting with NPM. So we're kind of on our own. Um, we're left to our own devices to figure this out. Fortunately, um, open source, just like the web, is this unstoppable, benevolent force that can't be really held back by any particular um, entity. So regardless of who has the keys to the kingdom at any one time, it's, the web will continue to move forward. So we saw this with Node and with IOJS. Um, 
Node was under the stewardship of the Joyent Foundation or the Joyent Corporation, and um, they kind of dropped the ball on maintaining Node and pushing it to 1.0. So naturally, a fork was created, and this is where the true innovation happened um, with Node. And for a while, it was called IOJS, but it was still really, at its core, it was really the real Node. Eventually, through a series of uh, political exercises, IOJS was turned back into Node and we're all happy again and the innovation continues. With NPM, it's kind of a different story. So we have this NPM client um, and we recently saw Google and Facebook um, release this new Yarn tool, which is not a fork of NPM, but the motivations for creating it were similar to the motivations for creating IOJS. There was, there's not, an, not, not enough uh, innovation um, in the NPM client, so a new thing emerges, and um, it's very exciting for JavaScript developers because now we have a choice. We can use NPM or Yarn, and we're seeing more and more innovation in this space. So we don't really know what will happen, but we know that things will continue to move forward, which is very exciting. So I just want to talk about some of the tools that I use to um, find modules, discover modules, figure out which ones are going to work for me. Um, GitHub.com, even though it's not specifically designed for uh, JavaScript developers, has a lot of interesting signals of package quality. So um, downloads aren't really necessarily a good indication because there's things like uh, CI services that run um, and install numerous packages. So when you look at a download count for an NPM package, it can be a false signal of popularity. Whereas things like the number of contributors on a repository give you a very strong signal about how well adopted a package is or how likely it is that it will continue to be maintained. If you only see one contributor on a package, it's an indication, not that it's a bad package, but you're kind of taking a gamble because it's really only one person who has developed it. So here on this page, we can see issues and pull requests, which kind of give an indication of project health. They can be seen as a good thing or a bad thing. Just depends on the case. Uh, I use a site called ghub.io every single day. Um, it's a way to um, redirect to the GitHub repository page for an NPM package. So rather than typing npmjs.com slash package slash cheerio, you type ghub.io slash cheerio and you go straight to the GitHub website. So here's some more examples. Chokidar is a really awesome file watcher. NPM RC is a thing for switching between um, different NPM registries. So you can swap out your NPM RC file. DuckDuckGo, you've all heard of it and you probably know its uh, claim to fame is that it's the browser that doesn't track you. But really the more interesting thing is the feature they have called bangs, which are um, like commands that you can use when conducting a search. So here in the screenshot you see there's the bang gh command, which allows you to do a GitHub search. Um, if you, can, you can actually configure your browser so that you can uh, run these commands directly from the address bar, just like the way Google works in, in Chrome. So this is really nice because it takes out uh, an intermediate step in your process of getting from uh, point A to point B. It's kind of like a command line for your address bar. And there's a bunch of these bangs. So there's obviously this GitHub one. Um, Chew is a great uh, sort of alternative to to React that borrows from some of the principles of React. Um, Stack Overflow, Microsoft Developer Network. Uh, you can jump straight to uh, API documentation for Node, Google Maps, YouTube, the list goes on. You don't have to put the bang at the beginning of the command, you can put it at the end too, or anywhere inside the command. As long as it's got a bang at the beginning, that's the indicator. A bang by itself means uh, Take me straight to the first result. So more, more on bangs at, at this website. Uh, so NPM Hub, this is a plug for a project that I created, but I've maintained it for a long time, so it's not really vaporware. Um, it's a browser extension that when you're on a GitHub page that has a package.json in it, it will introspect the package.json file, look up all the dependencies, 
and then list them underneath the README. So it's a really exciting way to uh, discover new packages. So if you're looking at a project from, a, from an author that you are familiar with and you trust, you can see what packages they use. And the social signal is a, a strong one. Also in the corner, you see there's a dependency tree visualization button, um, which is kind of interesting. It gives you a, a way to explore and navigate the entire uh, dependency tree of, of any package on NPM. <coughs> Octolinker is a really useful one, too. It's another uh, browser extension that will find all of the import and require statements in all the JavaScript files that you're browsing on github.com and turn them into links. So as you're browsing code on GitHub, you can click the link, and you can actually find out what that package is. Libraries.io is a web service created by a uh, former GitHubber. It's uh, an attempt to collect all the information from uh, all the different package managers, not from just from JavaScript, um, and aggregate them and present interesting metadata about the packages. Um, so here's an example. This was released recently. So you can use libraries.io to visualize uh, what versions of your packages users are using. So if you're considering deprecating a certain version or uh, just making any kind of decisions about your product, you can refer to this uh, to see, oh, wait, we do have tons of users that are still using this old version. They also recently uh, released this uh, dependency tree. So you can see a, an expanded tree of, of all the dependencies in your package. So here's some command line tools that I use. So those were, those were browser tools, and then these I use on the command line. So if you haven't used Yarn yet, uh, Yarn Global Add is the equivalent of npm install dash dash global. And then I don't like typing try module, so I just alias it to try. Try module is um, an npm package that creates a REPL for you with the given package uh, preloaded. So in this case, I'm trying the array of French words um, package, and I'm giving it a shorthand name of mot. And then I can interact with the package right there in the REPL. And it's a really great way to, uh, you find a package and you want to know, like, does this, does, does this do what I want to do? Um, it's easier than creating a new temporary project somewhere, creating a package.json, npm installing the package, running node, requiring, it just skips a bunch of steps. And it gives you a really quick way to just assess whether the package is what you want or not. GHWD is a command for um, jumping to the uh, GitHub repository page that corresponds to your working directory in your terminal. So you're working on a project, and you type GHWD, and you bounce to that web page. It's a really quick way to just, um, let's say you push a commit, and you want to go open a pull request, GHWD, and you open up that branch. NTL, I think it stands for node task list. Um, if you have just cloned a repository and you know it's an NP, you know it's got you've run npm install and you want to figure out what the commands are, typically what you'll do is open up the package.json file or cat it or type npm run, and that'll show you what the scripts are that you can run. Uh, but NTL is better in a way because uh, it's interactive. So you run NTL and it gives you this thing that you can actually this list of items that you can choose to actually run the scripts. So even on your own projects, when you come back to a project, you don't remember the names of all the scripts. This is a really nice way to run them. Registry packages. So this is a list of packages. If you're actually interested in um, diving into the NPM registry and figuring out, like consuming all of the metadata of the registry to, to um, build new tools for discovery. Uh, package stream is a good one. It, um, it's, a, it's a stream of data from the NPM registry that's live. So you could run this on a server and it will continually pull. It'll pull down every package, uh, metadata for every package in the registry, and then continue polling the, the canonical CouchDB registry uh, for changes. Um, all the packages is a, a, an equivalent package, the stream, but it's an offline um, download of all the metadata. So when you npm install it, you up front are making a 500 megabyte query. Um, 
But then you end up with this file that you can stream and do all kinds of interesting things with the metadata. Nice package. If any of you have ever looked at the, the metadata in the NPM registry, the JSON file is like this horrific blob of all kinds of crazy stuff, and it's not very human friendly. So a nice package is just a package that normalizes all of the package metadata into something more presentable and usable. Dependent packages is another package for finding out what packages depend on another packages. And this is, this, this is one of the really the strongest signals of package quality is how many other packages depend on this one. Octocad is just a great node library for uh, interacting with the GitHub API. So you probably thought I was going to talk about Electron. Sorry to disappoint. Uh, there is a little bit about Electron here. Um, Electron is just this awesome amalgamation of Chromium and Node.js. Uh, here's a really simple example where you can just use require statements right inside an HTML file, which is just like so awesome. Uh, in this basic example, this would actually read all the files from your home directory and your file system and display them in a web page. So that kind of illustrates the, the basic power of an Electron app. This is just a celebration of the beauty of Electron. <laughs> so there are 15,000 open source or public repos on GitHub uh, that depend on Electron. So uh, for the last couple of months, I've been working on a project to uh, look at all of those dependencies, all those repos, and find out uh, patterns, figure out what uh, packages they're using, what they're using for dev development, uh, like what are their dev dependencies, um, which ones are NPM packages, what, are they, what other packages depend on those, uh, to try to get a sense of really what's going on in the Electron ecosystem. There are also 1,700 packages on the NPM registry specifically for Electron in some way. So there's a lot going on. And it's just a matter of discovery. So last night, uh, I released this website, Userland, on the Electron website. And it's a bunch of lists of uh, top repos, top packages, uh, top GitHub contributors, and NPM authors. So hasn't been announced on the NPM website yet, uh, so or on the Electron website yet. So you guys are the, the first people to hear about it. So enjoy. Um, here's an example of what you can do on this new website. So um, searching among the top apps, if you type browser, you can see that there are people are developing lots of experimental browsers on Electron. Um, some notable ones are Beaker and, of course, the Brave browser, which you've probably all heard of. I'm out of time. Happy hacking. Thanks for your time. <laughs>